Let's pray. God, we love you. We bless your name tonight. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us, to our families, to our church, to our city, to the nation, to the world. God, you are working. We need eyes to see it. We need hearts to believe it. We need the determination to be a part of it. And so, God, we pray that you would supply all of it to us. God, we don't want to live our life looking back someday with regrets And so we pray, please, today, right now in this place, that you would cause us to be, as we apply ourselves to your word, that you'd cause us to be even more profoundly used for the advancement of your kingdom, and even more importantly than that, God, that we would grow in our relationship with you, that there would be a depth and an intimacy that we would experience that would be deeper and more intimate than ever before in our lives. And God, we confess that sometimes we struggle, sometimes we battle apathy, we battle spiritual lethargy, we fight against our flesh, we fail in our battle against this world, but we pray, God, that you would be greater than all of that in our lives. As we make that our confession, as we turn away from it and turn to you, God, we pray that we would be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And God, that we would remember you won the victory for us on the cross. And so we pray tonight that we would be compelled by the love of Christ as it was demonstrated so clearly in the sacrifice of his own life. We love you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you certainly are aware that this is, and if you didn't know this, you're going to know it now, this is one of the most controversial books in the Bible. Uh, And, you know, I rarely say that. There are a handful of books that carry with them a level of controversy, and the Song of Solomon is one of those books, or the Song of Songs is one of those books that carries with it controversy, and I'm going to tell you why it carries controversy and why there are actually some pastors that avoid this book completely. Uh, Solomon was prolific in writing Proverbs. The Bible says he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. And he was significant in songwriting. He wrote 1,005 songs. Now, this really is the only song that we have. So, you know, it's called the Song of Songs, which means that it it was his greatest hits. You know, I mean, if he had a greatest hit album, this would be, you know, each chapter would be a different song. He was prolific. And really, when you read this, you're going to recognize how brilliant of a songwriter he was. Uh, And I want to encourage you, you know, it's so easy to go quickly through this book and be confused about its application. The reality is, I think that this book, no pun intended, is pregnant with meaning. I mean, really, I I didn't even mean it. It has so much for us, and I pray that, you know, you're able to glean from it. The theme, of course, is love. This is a love song. Uh, It's what he's writing about. It's obvious. It is called the Song of Songs because there's no higher theme a song can have than love. You know, I think about all the love songs that have been written over the years, the centuries, the decades, Uh, and it is interesting to me that there can be such a variety of songs when, you know, their theme essentially is the same. You know, different love songs can can come out, and it's like, wow, there's a nuance to it. There's a uniqueness to it, Uh, and that really doesn't speak to the brilliance of the person writing it. It speaks to the, the theme Love is amazing. Love is beyond our ability to comprehend uh, or really understand. The depth of love certainly goes beyond our own personal experience, and yet Solomon is really seeking to capture it. Now, there is a difference of opinion when it comes to the interpretation of this book, and I'm going to share with you some of the different approaches to the Song of Solomon, and then I'm going to share with you the approach that we're going to be taking. There are some who believe that The Song of Solomon is like a marriage manual. Um, It speaks to intimacy in marriage. And so really, the uh, angle of interpretation is is literal. It says what it says, and it means what it means. Uh, There are some people who have a real struggle with this because there are parts of this book that seem um, almost erotic in nature. And so because of that, there's really been an effort to avoid the literal interpretation of this book. So there are others who have taken the uh, angle or the road of allegorical interpretation, which simply means that 
there's a hidden meaning behind the plain meaning. It means that really there is a story behind the story here. It's figurative, it's not literal. Uh, and so they would say, these people would say, that the Song of Solomon is really about Yahweh's love for Israel. Or these people would say the Song of Solomon is really about Jesus' love for his bride. Now, let me tell you what I believe. I believe in the literal, grammatical, historical interpretation of Scripture. And I believe that God says what he means and he means what he says. I say that to you guys all the time, right? So why would I then get to a book and say, well, I meant that for every other book in the Bible, all other 65, but when it comes to this particular book, um, I have a different method of interpretation. I don't believe that I have the freedom to do that. No matter how uncomfortable it may make a person feel when they're presenting this book, the reality is the first angle of interpretation we always should be making is the literal one. Now, there are certainly times when we're studying this book where we're going to see uh, that there may be the latitude for allegorical interpretation, where there may be some symbolism that's being presented, where we may be able to say, well, you know what, this really does reflect God's love for the nation of Israel, and there are going to be places where I point that out. And there are going to be times when we're studying this book where I'm going to say to you that this really does reflect Jesus' love for his bride. But there are other times where we're going to be reading stuff and you're going to be like, I hope that this doesn't mean that this is how Jesus loves his bride. Because if it does, I'm really uncomfortable with that interpretation. And you're going to see what I mean when we get to those portions of Scripture. There are many who have taken the allegorical perspective. You know, people like Moody, Spurgeon, Origen, all of those individuals said that Solomon was prophetically speaking about uh, Jesus's or Christ's love for his bride. But uh, we're going to take the, the literal interpretation first. And, um, you know, the background of this story is that Solomon is heading up to northern Israel. He's going to check out his vineyards. He runs into this Shulamite, this Shulamite woman, he falls in love with her. She comes back to Jerusalem. She's brought back to Jerusalem. He marries her, and this book is about their marriage and the consummation of their marriage. It's actually a beautiful story if you take it literally, and I think it is a vital book for us today to take literally because uh, even though the issue of the sexual relationship between a man and a woman can be very uncomfortable in a church setting, I think it ought to be, and it's most important for it to be, to be presented in the church setting. Because if you go to the world to get your understanding of what a physical relationship should be about between a man and a woman in uh, the, the confines of marriage, if you go to the world, man, you are going to be confused because the world worships sex. You guys understand that today? At the, okay, you live in Las Vegas. More of you should be nodding your head. The, the world worships sex. Now, some of you might be here tonight, you might be thinking, you know, I'm really advanced in my marriage. I, I really don't need this. You need to pay attention tonight because you're going to be really challenged in your marriage relationship. Some of you might be single tonight, and you might be thinking, I'm not married. How does this apply to me? We're going we're to lay a foundation. This is very important for you because in this book, I pray to God, we are going to undo some of the things that you've, you've learned in the world and that you will inevitably, <laughs> sorry, it's been a long day, you will inevitably bring into your marriage relationship. You want to make sure you have a solid, in other words, I'm saying this, you want to make sure you have a solid foundation for intimacy when you get married. And so you need to be paying close attention in this study. If you go to the world and you, you get your understanding about intimacy between a man and a woman, and listen, um, this is obviously the first guideline that God has set on intimacy. It is supposed to be between a man and a woman, not between a man and a man, and not between a woman and a man. And I'm going to present it like this throughout the, the study of this book. I'm going to take it for granted that you understand that. We're talking about intimacy between a man and a woman, physical intimacy. 
If you go to the world, you're going to come away with a misunderstanding because this is what the world worships. This is what the world declares to everybody in our generation. Listen to the music, li watch the television programs, go to a movie, and the basic thing you come away with when it comes to relationships is that it's all about sex. Now, on the other hand, there are certain elements, particularly in Christianity, that have viewed the relationship between a man and a woman uh, physically to be almost like an unclean thing to be avoided, something to be embarrassed of, something to be ashamed of, you know, something that really is only for procreation and certainly not for pleasure or for enjoyment. Um, that is as equally false. You know, both of those things are absolutely not true. The world proclaims to be the expert on the physical relationship between a man and a woman. And I want to tell you tonight that the world is not the expert. God is the expert because God's the one who made it, right? God made a man and a woman. And, uh, you know, there are some teachers, particularly among the anti-Nicene fathers, who taught that sex was a product of the fall, that God never intended a man and a woman to come together physically, uh, almost as if God was surprised by the whole thing, right? I mean, he made Adam, he made Eve, he went out for coffee, he came back, he's like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, who gave you this idea? And he was shocked, you know, not the case. God made the sexual relationship, he, he made man to be joined to the woman, that they, between the both of them, would become one flesh, and we're talking about oneness, not just spiritually, not just intellectually, emotionally, but also physically. And God said, it is good. All right, it is good. Do we all understand tonight that the physical relationship between a man and a woman in the confines of marriage is a good thing? Amen. All right, thank you for being engaged tonight in the Bible study. Uh, and then in addition to that, listen, if you were kind of on shaky ground when it came to that, we know that this is the case because God included the Song of Solomon in the Bible. Listen, I don't, have the free, I don't have the freedom to go from Ecclesiastes to Isaiah and skip the Song of Solomon because this book is just as inspired as every other book that God wrote. And so it deserves the type of care and attention uh, that we give to every other book of the Bible. So... The Song of Solomon. The Bible says in chapter 1, verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Now, there are a number of characters in this book, as you're going to see. Uh, there's certainly, we know, the Beloved, who is the king that speaks of Solomon. There's the Shulamite, who is the bride. She is the betrothed of Solomon. There are the daughters of Jerusalem. They're kind of like the backup band. You know, they're like the little doo-wop group on the side. And whenever there's something really cool that uh, the Shulamite says, they're in the background going, doo-wop, doo-wop, you know. <laughs> Praise God, give them glory, we're all for you, sister. Uh, and then there are the brothers of the Shulamite who are not necessarily for this relationship. In fact, you're going to see that they are more engaged in disrupting it. So the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, the Shulamite, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Draw me away. And the daughters of Jerusalem say, we will run after you. The Shulamite says, the king has brought me into his chambers and the daughters of Jerusalem. This is their doo-wop part. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. So the Shulamite begins. The Shulamite, the betrothed, the woman who is in love with the beloved, with the king. Uh, it is interesting that she is the one who is first to declare her love for the beloved. And you can see the poetry with which she describes her affection for him. She says, let, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Of course, wine uh, was typical. It was something that signified celebration. It signified refreshment. It was sustaining. And on this night, 
on the marriage night, she is thinking about the beginning of their intimacy. And she's celebrating. She's excited. Listen, because she's preserved herself. She's kept herself. This will be the first time that she's kissed her beloved. We're going to talk about the importance of preserving yourself, living in purity until that day that God brings you together with your husband or with your wife. Remember, the Bible is clear about the confines of the sexual relationship between a man and a woman. The Bible says that the marriage bed is undefiled. In other words, the sexual relationship between a man and a woman when they're married is a very good thing. But the Bible conversely says in that same verse, fornicators and adulterers will be judged. So she's looking forward. She's preserved herself. She's kept herself. She's in a place of celebration. Uh, you know, it's so beautiful. On that day, that wedding day, uh, when you have determined in your life to keep yourself and to preserve yourself. Listen, if you got yourself in trouble before you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, I want to tell you tonight, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have a brand new beginning. And in this brand new beginning, man, you need to handle yourself the right way. She thinks about his name, and she says that his name is like, ointment. It's like oil. It has a fragrance. It's like spikenard, similar to the spikenard that would have been poured out on the head of Jesus by Mary. It's fragrant. She's thinking about this time of betrothal, and every time his name came across her mind, her heart was filled with pleasure and with excitement. Uh, do you remember those days? Do you remember? Guys, listen, you better be all over this study, I'm telling you tonight. I mean, if anybody ought to be amening tonight, it's you guys. Do you remember those days? Amen. Uh, man, those days when the, just the, the name, hearing the name of your betrothed, the one that you were so intrigued in, interested in, consumed by every single waking thought was about him, was about her, and every time you heard the name spoken to you, it was like your feet left the ground, and there was an overwhelming sense, a shudder of pleasure went through your bones. Do you remember those days? Hey, those are good days, but those days should not be over. Those shouldn't just be the days of old. Those shouldn't be bygone days. Uh, I'm saying to you that those days should be alive and well today, that the name, when you hear the name, and listen, we've all got work to do in this area. This book is going to be challenging for all of us. It's going to really, to you know, the core of our relationship, challenge us to be loving our spouse in the way that we ought to be. But that name should not bring up thoughts of bitterness and anger and, oh, oh. I hate it when he does that. That name, you know? Don't even say his name. That's not what it should be. It should be, man, his name. I love his name. It's like ointment. Man, it's like a fragrance to me. This is what the Shulamite says. And the daughters are excited. The daughters of Jerusalem, listen, they're excited. They're engaged. She's going to the chamber of the king. She's going to consummate this marriage relationship, and they're excited. They're running after her, but of course, they can only go so far, and they say, listen, we are glad, and we rejoice in you. We will remember what we had, and what we had was a blessing, but things from this point on will change, right? We're rejoicing. Listen, when a brother or a sister in the Lord gets married, there ought to be a level of excitement and encouragement that we bring to them. We're going to talk about that later as well. By the way, this is going to go till 9 or 10 o'clock tonight, so get comfortable. I'm just kidding. There ought to be a level of excitement, but there also be, ought to be the realization that when they get married, things are going to dramatically change. I mean, you used to be hanging out, you know, I mean, pizza night on Monday night, watching the Patriots play football and... <laughs> You know, going fishing and going shooting, going hunting and doing all of these things, if your expectation is that none of those things are going to change when your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ gets married, 
you got another thing coming. The nature of your relationships legitimately change. There's a brand new focus relationally when it comes to human beings in your life, and that focus requires your attention. And this is what the daughters of Jerusalem are declaring. We will remember. Things from this point on will change, but we will remember. The Shulamite says, rightly do they love you. I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar. These particular tents were made out of fabric that was dark. She's uh, giving an illustration of the darkness of her skin. Like the curtains of Solomon, do not look upon me because I'm dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. And so listen, she is just about to step into the consummation, consummation of this marriage relationship, and she's overcome by insecurity. She's struggling. She's struggling with the color of her skin. Now, at this particular time in this culture, um, it was kind of the reverse of the way it is today. Today, we have tanning booths, and we have all this stuff that you can cake onto your skin to make your skin darker, right? right? I know those of you who, who uh, shake and bake, okay? I, I know... I'm, <laughs> It's like you can tell. Your, your skin gets all crispy crittered. But it's, you know, in our culture, we want to we wanna be darker. In this particular culture, it was, in their eyes, every culture changes. That's why, listen, don't be led by whatever the culture is saying today, because I guarantee you it's going to change tomorrow. But she was struggling, because really, it was better to be fairer in those days. And she says, listen, it's been a hard life for me. I'm dark in skin because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons, maybe my stepbrothers, this may be what she's saying, my stepbrothers have mistreated me. They have made me go out and work in the vineyards, and because I've been working, I haven't been able to take care of myself. Listen, she's struggling with insecurity. She's entering into this physical relationship, the consummation of this marriage, and she's overwhelmed by her inadequacies. And you guys understand that in the beginning it was not so. The Bible says that when Adam and Eve were in the garden before the fall, they were naked and they were unashamed. There was no insecurity. Uh, there was no sense of inadequacy. It wasn't until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that sin entered into the world and they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed. They began to recognize and realize their own inadequacies, and they were insecure about it. And so what did they do? They went to the nearest tree, a fig tree, which, by the way, has very bristly, uncomfortable leaves. Not sure why they picked the fig tree. Like, Adam probably was like, woman, this was the first really bad decision that you've ever made. Can we go for another tree? But they wove for themselves something to cover themselves. There was this sense of vulnerability um, and inadequacy. This is the very thing that God desires to overcome in the marriage relationship. The greatest place of acceptance in our lives outside of our relationship with God ought to be in our relationship with our spouse. The place where we feel most accepted. The place where we feel the least sense of insecurity right, ought to be with the one who is supposed to love us the most. Our marriage relationship ought to be a place where we can be vulnerable, hey, just as we are. I'm saying this, that your marriage should be a sanctuary for your spouse. It should be a safe haven. It should be a safe place. One of the greatest gifts you can give your spouse is acceptance to accept them for who they are and for what they are. In other words, you're not berating, you're not undermining, you're not demeaning, you're not pointing out areas. Hey, you know, I kind of, I've noticed you, you got, you, you, you know, you look more like a pear than a pencil, and I was thinking maybe you might be able to go to the gym from time to time. No, those are not the words that you want to be sharing with your spouse. You shouldn't be undermining. You shouldn't be demeaning. You ought to be encouraging. You ought to be lifting up. You say to me, well, you know what? They just happen to do things that drive me nuts. You know, God, I believe, has divinely uh, given differences 
in marriage between you and your spouse so that between the two of you as he makes you one, you are more effective for the advancement of God's kingdom. I'm saying that God has uniquely gifted your spouse differently so that the two of you together can be a greater force for the kingdom of God. But listen, differences between you and your spouse, whether it's, you know, you squeeze the toothpaste and she rolls it up from the bottom or whatever it might be, uh, those differences, if we're not walking in the spirit, can become sources of division, places where we become discouraged and we become bitter against our spouse. Uh, I love how he responds here to her inadequacy and sense of insecurity. He says in verse 7, actually this is now her turning to him, tell me, O you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? Then he says this, if you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. I've compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Now that was a compliment back then. We're going to explain that in a minute. Please do not go home and say to your wife, babe, I just want to say you're, you're like a horse. <laughs> Don't do that. Your cheeks are, you're, that's not the only uh, compliment that really doesn't fit our culture. We'll talk about some other ones later. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. And so, listen, I love the way he responds to her insecurity. What does he do? He lavishes her with words. He says things, man, that build her up and lift her up. And this was a compliment. He says, you know what you are like? You're like a Philly cheesesteak. No, you're like, <laughs> you're like a Philly. You know, a Philly uh, is a horse, a female horse, young, vibrant, full of life, up to four years of age. He says, you're like a filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Now, all of the horses that drew Pharaoh's chariots were stallions. And so what he is saying is, he says, you are amazing. You are like none other. You are unbelievable. You are beyond description. You make everybody else pale in comparison. Don't be focused on your inadequacies. Don't be worried about your insecurities because I am overwhelmed by your beauty and your beauty is like none other. Ain't that smooth? I mean, this dude, he knew what to say, right? Not only did he lavish her with words, and I want to encourage you to really know what ministers to your spouse. Your spouse may be someone, every spouse loves to hear words that build up. Uh, and I think that this is something we really need to take to heart because oftentimes we find ourselves saying things that that tear down instead of build up. But you need to know what ministers to your spouse. Many spouses uh, are kind of geared by God to be blessed by words that lift up. But he doesn't just lavish her with that. He lavishes her with gifts. He says, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments and your neck with chains of gold. Listen, he lavished her with gifts. He went the extra mile. He was thinking about what would bless her. You know, he was premeditating what would honor his spouse, what would honor his wife, particularly on this night. Guys, I want to encourage you to be blessing your wife with words that will lift her up and to be premeditating, you know, thinking ahead, thinking about things that you can lavish her with so that she believes and feels that you have the understanding that she is like no other that she stands, in a sense, head and shoulders above everybody else. The daughters of Jerusalem give their due up. They say, we will make you ornaments of gold with studs of sil silver. So they're being a blessing to the Shulamite. The Shulamite says, while the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of En Gedi. And you think, yeah, what's a henna bloom? <laughs> so now she's thinking about seducing her husband. Seduction, listen to me tonight. I hope that you're not uncomfortable tonight. Seduction is a good thing when 
a husband is seducing his wife or a wife is seducing her husband. That is a good thing. She says, while the king is at his table, I have premeditated. I have prepared myself. I have kind of unleashed the fragrance of myrrh. And while he is at work, it is going to draw his attention. It is going to seduce him. It is going to draw him to me. There's a premeditation. There's a pre-planning. There's thought that goes ahead of time, right? In seducing, in preparing yourself for physical intimacy with your spouse. I mean, it's more than just a physical act of the sexual relationship. It's an engagement emotionally. It's an engagement spiritually. And it deserves time. It deserves thought. It deserves premeditation. Um, it goes beyond just the act she is thinking about that first night they're actually going to be able to spend the whole night together. Listen, this is a blessing when you wait, when you wait for that day, you know, when you're doing things God's way, when you're honoring God, this will be part of your conversation with your betrothed. You'll be looking forward to that day, not just of consummating your marriage uh, physically, but you'll be looking forward to that day when you guys will actually be able to sleep together the whole night and wake up in each other's arms. This is a beautiful picture. Listen, you don't get this picture painted for you uh, by Hollywood, and certainly you don't get it painted for you through the movie industry. You find it in the Word of God. These things ought to be uh, being communicated to us as we certainly study the Scriptures and realize God's plan for marriage. She says of her betrothed, of her beloved, she says, you're like a henna blossom uh, in the vineyards of En Gedi. Now, if you go with me to Israel, uh, as we travel, depends on which way we go, but as we travel from Jerusalem all the way down to the Dead Sea, I mean, it is, you know why they call it the Dead Sea? Because there's nothing that lives in it. It's brilliant, isn't it? The Dead Sea. But it's surrounded by desert. I mean, it is, you guys think we live in desert? It is like desert, desert. There is absolutely nothing alive. And as you travel south on uh, our way to Masada, to the resort there uh, a little later at the Dead Sea, you pass by this beautiful oasis where there are palm trees uh, and there's a stream that's running uh, where I take you back on this nature hike and there's this beautiful waterfall where David penned the majority of the Psalms that he wrote. It happened there in this oasis. And she says of her beloved, she says, you are like an oasis to me. You're like a henna uh, in blossom before me. There's a fragrance. When I think of you, I think of something that is so refreshing and amazing, and I've prepared myself for this night of love. Verse 15 says, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair, you have dove's eyes. And so you see this beautiful exchange between the beloved and the Shulamite. He talks about her fairness. He expresses his, his love for her. He says that she has dove's, live, dove's eyes. Excuse me. Remember, Solomon was uh, not only a man filled with wisdom, he was also a man who had understanding of science. He knew that doves were birds that maintained their fidelity, right? When they mated together, they maintained that fidelity for their whole life uh, until death did they part. Uh, and so he's speaking of more than just her having bird eyes, all right? You understand that tonight. Hey, babe, you got bird eyes. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you have pleasant eyes. A dove is a symbol of peace. But also he's speaking of their loyalty and their fidelity. And, and you know, he's saying literally to her, listen, I am a one-woman man. Uh, now, of course, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. But this is where we're going to allegorize this message here tonight. Because this is certainly how it applies for us. You know, nothing is more securing, nothing evokes intimacy more than that sense of fidelity and safety in a relationship. And to not only declare it, but to also live it. Notice how the Shulamite responds. She is provoked by his overture of fidelity. And he says, she says, excuse me, in verse 16, Behold, you're handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. 
the beams of our house, houses are cedar and our rafters of fir. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. She says, dude, you are hot, all right? That's modern vernacular. She says, you are a hottie, and I'm glad that you are mine. And our bed is green, right? It's a place that should always be, be green. It's a place of newness. It's a place of life. It's a place of refreshing. She says, I'm the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Now, um, it's possible that she is literally saying, listen, I'm in blossom. I'm blossoming for you. I'm, I am in, I'm in blossom for you. My life has come to fruition for this moment. Uh, it's also possible that she is saying, uh, because the rose of Sharon was common, the lilies of the valley in that particular day, they were uh, common plants and flowers. She may be saying, you know what? I'm nothing special. You know, I'm just ordinary. Uh, she may have been kind of fishing for a compliment. Ladies, you know how that goes? <laughs> when you're fishing for a compliment, hey, honey, uh, do I look fat in this dress? You know, I, I know I've been kind of looking a, a little older and I've been s struggling a little bit in my physical appearance and then there's this pause, all right? You know, in those pauses, she is not looking for you to affirm what she just said. Do you understand that tonight? Yeah, honey, I'm glad you've noticed because I've been noticing too. What can we do about this problem? <laughs> all right, th th that's, not, that's not what you want to do. I love what he says. He says, no, like a lily among thorns... He says, babe, no, you got it all wrong. You aren't like an ordinary lily. You are like a lily, and everybody else is like a thorn, right? And this dude's smooth. I'm just telling you straight. This guy is, is smooth. And, you know, there's, the reality is this, that we need to understand when our spouse is kind of provoking us for an overture of affirmation. You know, when they need to hear a sense of affirmation. Now, tonight you may be thinking, things ain't what they used to be, Pastor. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, he started tall, dark, and handsome, and now he is short, fat, and bald. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the converse may be true as well, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder tonight, I want to tell you. The reality is this, we age together. And you probably aren't as hot as you were on the day of the wedding either. You know, this is just the nature of life. This is the progression of time. And the reality, I believe, is this. If our heart is right, you know, if we're not comparing our spouse to other people, you understand that's what lust is. Lust is comparing yourself, your spouse to somebody else. It is wanting your spouse to be somebody or something your spouse isn't. It is wanting, uh, you know, someone who's a little taller, someone who's a little buffer, somebody who has a little more hair, somebody who is a little skinnier, somebody who is a little more voluptuous. Listen, whatever it is, all of those things, when you go down the road of looking with your eyes or I go down the road of looking with my eyes and we begin to want something that God hasn't given to us, do you know what that's called in the Bible? That's called lust. And God never intended for your spouse to measure up to somebody else because we ought to be living in a place where we are so deeply thankful for what God has given us. And when we're walking in the Spirit, not only is this the reality, but this is truly a possibility where we walk in the Spirit of God and are so thankful with what God has blessed us with. I remember when I was getting married, a good brother came to me He's a pastor uh, in Texas now. And he wrote a letter to me, and he said this one thing that I'll never forget. He said, Derek, never forget that your wife is God's perfect gift to you. Never forget that. Uh, and it is stuck with me. And you know what that means? It means that I don't need anything else. It means that God knew exactly what I needed, and Rachel is the fulfillment. She is the perfect answer she is the puzzle piece that was missing for my whole life. And I don't need to go anywhere else. I don't desire to go anywhere else. I don't want anything else because not only do I know that that's not the will of God for my life, I'm smart enough to know the grass is not greener. 
The grass is not greener. You may think the grass is greener. You know, your flesh may be saying to you, hey, the grass is greener. This experience will be greater. They are more beautiful or they have a deeper love for God. You know, tonight you may be married to an unbeliever. It's been a long road. It's been a challenge for you. You might be looking outside of that marriage relationship now for satisfaction. You need to stop. You're already married. Be blessed with the wife or the husband of your youth. And as you and I walk in the Spirit truly, uh, what we will experience are blessings. He says, babe, you are like a lily among thorns. And so she responds in chapter 2, verse 3, like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So she says, thanks for calling me a lily. It's better than a filly. I'd rather be a lily. And now, you know what? You're an apple tree. You're like an apple tree. She, <laughs> this was, by the way, these were all good things. She says, you're like an apple tree. Everybody else, you know, is just a regular tree, a deciduous tree. Everyone else is like a pine, but babe, you are like a fruit tree. You're like a fruit tree that is so satisfying. You provide my covering. This is what she says. I find my covering. I find my shelter. I find my shade when I sit down underneath you. This is an expression of submission. This is a, an expression of covering. This is what the marriage relationship ought to be. This is what a man ought to be providing for his wife. He ought to be providing a covering. There ought to be this sense of protection, this place of safety, this place of provision that a woman can submit herself to, can come underneath to. You know, when we talk about submission, oftentimes in our culture, the word submit has got all of these negative correlations, connotations. But ladies, I want to say to you, you know, is there anything you would rather submit to besides the Lord than a man who is going to love you as Christ loves the church, right? Isn't this what your heart desires as a married Right, ladies? Are you with me tonight? Uh, it, this is what you desire for your relationship with your husband. This is what, for those of you who are not married, this is what you desire someday. God has this as a gift for you. You desire a man who's going to love you like Christ loves the church. Listen, guys, if you are struggling in your relationship with your wife, and she's struggling with submission or reverence, I just want to say this. It's possible I'm not saying this may be the reason, only reason, but it may be a reason. Uh, she may be struggling because you're not providing the covering for her that she needs. You're not loving her as Christ loves the church. She's uneasy. She's uncomfortable. She doesn't know what to expect because the bottom line is this. You've been not walking with God. You're not walking with God, and the reality is you're more concerned about your work and your hobbies than you are with your wife, and you think that she's going to want to sit down under the shade of your covering? Listen, your tree is barren, and you need to be walking with God, and your wife needs, needs to be a priority. You need to be providing fruit and safety, provision and protection, so that she feels vulnerable enough to sit under your covering. And ladies, if if your husband is providing this, and listen, even if he is not, you have a responsibility to submit to your husband as, as unto the Lord, to honor him and to respect him and to bless God by doing so. There are two things that God has told a husband and a wife to do. As you study the scripture, these two things are the fundamental things. Number one, he has told men to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And number two, he is told women to submit unto the, their husband as unto the Lord. She says, this relationship is such a blessing. I find my shade underneath the covering of you. And then also she says, I find my pleasure in you. I'm not going to a fiction novel. I'm not watching the soap operas. I haven't found a new friend on Facebook that is lighting that fire that was lit years ago. This is a real issue today, right now, uh, when 
Husbands and wives are going through the divorce process. Statistics say that 50% of the time, Facebook is mentioned. I'm not berating social media today, okay? I'm not saying that it's evil. I'm saying that it can be used for evil. 50% of the time, Facebook comes up in the conversation as to one of the reasons or one of um, the causes of husbands and wives going down the road, ultimately, of separation and divorce. She says, I'm finding my pleasure in you. The Shulamite to the daughters of Jerusalem. Now she turns her attention to the, to the daughters of Jerusalem, to her friends. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. What is she saying? She's like, this is crazy. This is so amazing. This is so awesome, all right, because, because I can't even contain myself. I am so in love. You can't even sustain me with cakes of raisins and apples. I am so excited to tell you girls how blessed I am by this relationship that God has given me. You know, when we got married, before we got married, we had so many people saying to us something like this, oh, enjoy it now. You know, we had so many people saying, well, you know what, give it a couple years. Uh, we had so many people saying to us, you know, the honeymoon period really ends like uh, two years in. And I was like, shut your face, all right? Just shut it. I don't even, even want to hear it. I, I mean, is this like words of encouragement that you think uh, are blessing newlyweds? And oftentimes, this is what we hear. You know, hey, maybe you're... Maybe your marriage stinks, but don't drag down other people's marriages. Come on. Get your marriage right so that you can be a blessing to other people, so that you can encourage. And listen, your marriage, my marriage, ought to be so amazing that when we talk to our friends, it shouldn't be, oh, I can't do that. You know, I got the old ball and chain tonight. And, you know, I wish I, wish I could go out, but you know how she is. You know, or, you know, my husband, he just is so demanding. I, I'd love to be a part of that, but, you know, it just never ends with him. And a lot of times I hear this in the body of Christ. I hear people talking about their spouse in less than honoring ways. The Shulamite says to the daughters of Jerusalem, I am overwhelmed. I'm lovesick. I'm so thankful for what God has done. His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And so listen, she gives an amazing piece of advice. She says to them, do not stir up love until it pleases. In other words, do things God's way. Do things according to God's timing. Don't get engaged in that physical relationship until you have made that marital commitment. And that's not the message of our culture today. This is today's plan. Date, date, kiss, cross the line, kiss some more, cross the line again, break up, and then start all over again. Date, date, kiss, cross the line, cross the line again, break up, and there's this cycle of failure and you wonder why marriages don't last. You get guys going to girls and saying, you know what, I, I really do believe that God may be doing something here, but I want to make sure that we're hitting on all cylinders. I think that we need to engage in the sexual relationship because we don't want to get married and then find ourselves disappointed with each other sexually. Ladies, if there's a guy telling you this, you need to run for the hills. He does not love you and it certainly doesn't sound like he loves God at all. You don't want a guy who's going to be trying to coerce you to cross lines that God doesn't want you to cross. Uh, and then in addition to that, guys, I know godly men uh, who, while they've been walking through the betrothal process, have had literally girls who say they love God, not date them anymore, because they've laid out clear parameters they said, listen, you know, I'm going to do this God's way. And, you know, we're not going to engage in the physical relationship. We're not going to cross the line. We're going to preserve ourselves until that day. And I've watched as these guys 
have had girls literally walk away from them because they were willing to do things God's way and not the world's way. If you want ultimately your marriage to succeed today, whatever has happened in the past is the past, but beginning fresh today, you need to make sure that you're doing it God's way and that you're honoring God. Listen, if you want this to be a relationship that blesses the heart of God, you need to begin now. And so she gives him that piece of wisdom. She goes on to say, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping on the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. Now, you know, some of the leaping and the skipping may have passed with the years, but what the Shulamite is saying is that there's an excitement in the heart of the beloved to be engaged with his wife. There's an excitement. There's an anticipation. He's literally looking through the windows and waiting for her to come. Verse 10, my beloved spoke and said to me, rise up my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. God, this is beautiful, guys, to just go home and read to your wife. And so, so the Shulamite is being, called, uh, is being called away by the beloved. He's calling her away. He's saying, let's get away. Let's spend time together alone. But there's a distraction. Verse 15, the brothers of the Shulamite say, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. So listen, the picture is this. I'm not going to keep you a lot longer tonight. But the picture is this. The beloved is saying, come along, let's get away, let's be alone together, let's get some personal time, just you and me. Uh, listen, for those of you who are married, this is so important for you to stick into the DNA of your marriage relationship. You need time alone. You need time to get away. And I'm not saying, you know, you got to uh, take a trip to the Alps or, you know, you got to drive down to Southern California. I'm saying you've got to get time away. You've got to be alone with your wife. You know, you've got to go get coffee together. You need to go have dinner together. You need to get away and engage in that interpersonal relationship without distractions. And you know what? There are so many distractions. The brothers of the Shulamite say, uh-uh, not until you do your work, girl. You remember, you're tending the vines. And the little foxes have gotten to the vines right here at the time of harvest. And so you need to not get away with your beloved. You need to come and you need to deal with the work that's in front of you. Listen to me, there's always going to be something that can distract you. There's always going to be something that's a pressing need. There's always going to be something that gets in the way of you spending the time that you need with your husband or with your wife. There's always going to be a need but you've got to determine in your life that you're going to be disciplined. You know, a lot of times, those things that distract us aren't big things. A lot of times, they're little things. You know, uh, in this culture, it took just a few foxes going among the vines to destroy, you know, a whole orchard. And a lot, a lot of times, it's the small things in our life. You know, it's the small distractions in our life that are getting in the way. It's the arguments, oftentimes, right? The Bible says that, we need to keep a short record with our spouse. It's sometimes arguments that go past a night, that go past a day, that go past a week, where we're holding bitterness against our husband or our wife, and it is beginning to affect our physical intimacy with our husband or our wife. You know, you may think that you have the right to withhold physical intimacy from your husband or your wife, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that you're allowed only to do that if you're spending time with God in prayer and fasting because your body doesn't belong to you anymore. You may think that you have all of these spiritual reasons, but the reality is this, there is no good reason. Uh, and oftentimes we find ourselves embittered. 
you know, and our spouse is making overtures for physical affection, and because we're so bitter, we're so angry, we're resisting, we're throwing up our hands, we're saying there's no way, and the reality is there's an issue in our heart that has to be resolved. We're not right with God. We think our spouse isn't right, and listen, maybe our spouse has issues that need to be dealt with, but the reality is we have issues that need to be dealt with as well. These things hinder, they distract. The Bible says to us, do not let your son go down, do not let, excuse me, the son go down on your wrath. In other words, don't let anger pass over from one evening until the morning. Listen, I want to encourage you guys that are married, spend time with your spouse, get away, and don't let anything distract you. Verse 16, the Shulamite says, My beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bethar. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word tonight. God, we thank you that your word is sufficient even for things that we may sometimes be hesitant to talk about. God, we thank you that you have a plan for marriage. And God, whether we're single tonight or whether we're married tonight, I believe that you've spoken to all of us. You desire to undo our worldly thinking and to reshape us into the image of Jesus with a biblical foundation. And I pray tonight, God, that in this area of our life that is so crucial uh, that tonight, Father God, there would have been edification and building up. Tonight as our eyes are closed and tonight as our heads are bowed, tonight maybe you've come in this place and, you know, maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you tonight that Jesus loves you. He is like that beloved and you are like the Shulamite and he's calling you tonight. He's not calling you to religion or religiosity or church life necessarily. He's calling you to himself. He's calling you to redemption. He's calling you to forgiveness. He's calling you to healing. He's calling you because he wants to put your life back together. He wants to give you a brand new beginning. He's calling you tonight because he loves you. Tonight, have you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? Have you believed in Jesus for the saving of your soul for your eternal salvation have you believed in jesus and become a child of god tonight if the answer to that question is no god tonight is calling you to make a decision he's calling you to come tonight the spirit and the bride say come tonight come to jesus come tonight and put your trust and faith in the gospel of jesus christ would which declares that Jesus loved us so much that he died on the cross for our sins, was dead and buried, rose again on the third day, and that through faith in him we can be forgiven, we can be given the gift of everlasting life. Is this you tonight? If tonight you would say, Pastor, that's me, I need to come, I need forgiveness, I need cleansing, I need healing, I need my broken life to be fixed, I want to come to Jesus tonight, I want to pray for you tonight. I want to pray that God would give you the strength and courage to take this step of faith. If this is you tonight. I want to encourage you right now. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you tonight. You stretch that hand up high this evening. God bless you over here on my left. I see your hand. I see your hand in the back as well. Praise God. Anybody else? You stretch that hand up high. I see your hand over on my right. God loves you guys. He loves you. He loves you so much. And he is drawing you and calling you tonight. If the Spirit of God is touching your heart, listen to me, raise your hand. I want to pray for you this evening. Anybody else? God bless you. Thank you here in the front. You can put your hands down. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for these tonight that you've spoken to. And God, we pray now that you give them the strength and the courage to take this step of faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, if you raise your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know the Spirit of God has touched your life and you want to take this step of faith, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. This prayer begins your relationship with God. It's a prayer of repentance. To repent means to turn away from something. Tonight, you'll be turning away from sin 
All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You'll be turning away from unbelief. You'll be putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he died on the cross for your sins and rose on the third day for your justification. And tonight as you pray, you will receive the promises of God. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he called them publicly. He said to them, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me before man, so also will I deny you. He called Matthew publicly. He said to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, come and follow me. And so they did. And tonight, if you raised your hand, if the Spirit of God has touched your heart, you know you need to pray tonight to receive Christ. I want you to stand up tonight and come forward to the front, please, right now. Come on forward to the front. I want to lead you in this simple prayer tonight. If you raised your hand, come on forward. We're going to wait for you tonight. God bless you. God bless you guys. Praise God. Come on forward to the front here. God loves you guys so much. Praise the Lord. Right on. God is so good. God bless you. God bless you too. <laughs> Praise be to God. Anybody else tonight? You don't want to leave tonight with regrets. The Spirit of God is touching your life. Your heart is beating tonight. You know you need to take this step of faith. Things need to get right in your life. We want to give you another opportunity. Listen, you come forward right now and you join these that have gathered here tonight to pray. Anybody else? All right, if you're listening online tonight, you know you need to take this step of faith as well. I want to encourage you. I'm going to lead you guys in prayer tonight. This prayer is not to me. It's not to this church. It's to God through his son, Jesus Christ. And this is what God says. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's promised tonight to hear your prayer. And he's going to answer in mighty and miraculous ways. So as I lead you in prayer tonight, I want you to follow in prayer. I want to encourage you tonight to pray believing and to pray confidently because God is going to answer. Pray with me tonight. Dear God, God, tonight I give you my life. And tonight I confess I've sinned against you. But tonight I'm turning. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning away from unbelief. And I'm believing in Jesus that he died on the cross for me, that he rose on the third day, and that through faith in him, you've forgiven me, you've cleansed me, and you've made me your child. God, I love you, and I give you my whole life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you guys. I'm so excited for you.